Hello everyone, welcome back to Financial News. I'm Ron Jankowski with Channel 4 and Payless Heights and my co-host is Paul Municle from Ameriprise Financial. Today is November 14, 2022. Paul, can you give us an update? When you're finished, uh, we'll give an update as of this morning's news. Absolutely. Um, I'm going to keep on reporting the earnings and let you know that the near final outlook at Q3 earnings results and how they're coming in. Um, the historical timing of a market rebound versus earnings bottom. Now, through Friday, 91.5% of S&P 500 companies had reported their Q3 financial results. This week, the focus turns to retailers with the likes of Walmart, Target, Home Depot, and others all on the docket. Overall, there are 15 S&P 500 companies scheduled to report this week, including three that are also members of the Dow Jones Industrial Average. Aggregate corporate sales and earnings results have not changed over the last week. According to FactSet, S&P 500 companies are still on pace to post year-over-year -year earnings per share growth of positive 2.1% for Q3 on sales growth of positive 10.7%. At the end of the quarter, which was September 30th, consensus estimates were looking for Q3 EPS growth of 3% on sales growth of 8.5%. As we've consistently noted, the energy sector accounts for most of Q3's earnings upside. Excluding the energy sector, the S&P 500 EPS growth would be down 5.2% year over year on sales growth of 7%. Again, all the data according to FactSet's calculations. Meanwhile, forward estimates continue to fall. As of Friday, consensus EPS estimates for Q4 were at 54.76, <coughs> down from the $55.18 expected just last week and the $55.97 expected the week before that. The current estimate would represent a year-over-year -year decline of about 1%. Now, similarly, Estimates for the full year 2023 now look for EPS of $233.49. Now this number is down from the $241.61 forecast at the end of September and $250.94 $250 at the end of June. But it would still represent a gain of about 5% relative to the $221 currently estimated for 2022. So, with the forward estimates falling, combined with the real risk that corporate earnings show a few quarters of negative year-over-year -year results over the quarters ahead, the question is, what does this mean for investors? Answer is, historically, although it may seem counterintuitive, Stock prices can often bottom long before the economy or corporate earnings reach their lows. During the financial crisis period, the S&P 500 bottomed in late March of 2009. By comparison, the recession did not end until three months later. That according to NBER. And corporate earnings on a trailing 12-month basis did not bottom until January 2010. So likewise, during the recession of 1990 and 1991, the S&P 500 did bottom in October of the year 1990. That was long before the recession ended in April of 1991, and corporate earnings bottomed on a 12-month basis in December of 1992. So I can give you more details on that topic, which does, um, I think, uh, have a bearing to a lot of investors because we're looking at past history, which doesn't necessarily mean its results are going to work that way in the future, but that's what happened in the past and potentially could happen this could time. Could happen again. Right. 
but the Tao usually, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> the Tao usually gives a sign long before. Well, signs are not <coughs> easy to see uh, for everyone. Well, uh, Ameriprise had uh, give us some information as of this morning, and I'm losing my voice, and I apologize for that. U.S. stock index futures are lower this morning following a strong week for the S&P 500, up nearly 6%. Last week was nice for investors in the market to get a bit of a rebound like that. It's natural to see the market take a breather and figure out which way it wants to go. So again, that's just the futures. As we always say, that doesn't mean that's how the market's going to close. Yeah, exactly. Today. We have to be careful of that, futures. Uh, markets in Asia gave uh, back some of last week's gains while Europe is trading modestly higher at midday at their location. We're kind of, we always say it's a global connected economy. Yeah. and. We'll follow what they're doing and see what happens. Treasury yields are rebounding after a sharp drop last week with the 10-year up 3.90 percent and the two-year back to 4.4 uh, percent. Again, you're just getting a reaction to that big move last week. Yes. Bitcoin futures are catching a bid of uh, plus 1 percent after a volatile week. WTI crude is down 1 percent after falling 4 percent last week. What happened to the gas pumps? I don't I didn't see a 4% change on that. I'm kidding, Paul. <laughs> and gold is down 0.3% uh, after posting a strong 5.5% gain last week. So year-to-date percentages, the, the returns are improving. S&P 500, a minus 15%. Dow Jones, a minus 5%. That's a nice number. Yeah. NASDAQ, a minus 27%. So we're seeing some improvement. Some improvement. It shows just how rough this year's been when we're happy to see a negative 12 isn't and a negative that, 5. And isn't that pathetic, though? We're at least heading in the right direction. And I, I still keep saying before the end of the year, maybe we can post positive numbers. We'll yes. see. Yes. You, you, you never know. Never know. Really, really never know. Well, thank you, Paul. Stay with us. We'll be right back with our show called Your Money, an interesting topic uh, that Paul usually has. Stay with us. Thank you for staying with us. Uh, our show called Your Money. Paul has an interesting topic, making investing automatic with dollar cost averaging. Paul, I'm going to let you take it and go with it. Thanks, Ron. I mean, it's a topic we've talked about before on this show. Just want to give a little refresher on dollar cost averaging and why it may or may not work for your situation. Um, you know, just diving right in. Have you ever held off from making an investment because you're concerned that the timing may not be right? I'm guessing that's a lot of people that watch this show. Um, if this fear is preventing you from investing, dollar cost averaging might be an approach that you uh, may want to consider. It has the potential to help you accumulate wealth over time and throughout the market's highs and lows. So today we're going to go over an overview of the strategy. So let's start out with flat how it works. The concept is simple. You invest a consistent amount of money at regular intervals. You put the money to work in the same investment, a stock, a mutual fund, or any other type of asset, regardless of the price of that asset. This should continue over an extended period of time. Investing with such a defined cadence takes market timing out of the picture. If the asset has fallen in price, your periodic investment will allow you to purchase more shares. If the asset rises in price, you'll purchase fewer shares. If you are committed to your dollar cost averaging plan, all that matters is maintaining a consistent monthly investment, not the price of the investment you've chosen. You may want to periodically increase your monthly contribution amount um, in addition. So let's go over a brief practical example of how dollar cost averaging works. Suppose you commit $200 per month to purchase in a particular mutual fund. In the first month you invest the, um, the share price is $10 a share resulting in a purchase of 20 shares. 
In the second month, let's say the price drops to $8 and you purchase 25 shares with your $200. In the third month, the value is back to $10 and you again purchase 20 shares with your $200. In that example, in total, you accumulated 65 shares at an average price of $9.23 a share. Yet, after three months, your initial $600 investment is worth $650. Now, while this demonstrates the advantages of dollar cost averaging during periods of market volatility, keep in mind that the future direction of an investment's value is difficult to predict. If the share price continues to rise over time, you'll purchase fewer shares. That means the benefit of the systematic investment approach will be reduced. It's important to note that dollar cost averaging does not assure a profit or protect against a loss in declining markets. It's a way to utilize market volatility to your advantage if you invest consistently, hold the investment over the long term, and the underlying investment likely increases in value. You may already be doing dollar cost averaging um, and may already be part and it may already be part of your investment regimen. If a portion of your paycheck is directed to investments in your workplace retirement plan, you are taking advantage of this strategy by making consistent investments into a specific investment um, regardless of its value. Keep in mind the advantages and disadvantages discussed today as you consider whether to use dollar cost averaging. It may also help to consult with a financial advisor to find out more about how this strategy may fit into your financial plan. And of course, before you start investing in a dollar cost averaging plan, you must make certain that the investments you're making are appropriate for you in your personal situation. Dollar cost averaging may not work if you're investing in an inappropriate asset class or an or inappropriate stock or fund for you. It's not for everyone. You've got to get the right investment and then talk with your advisor about setting up some type of plan. All right, Paul, what if someone has a question to ask of you? Yep, if you want more information or more details on this, you can call me directly at 708-226-3412. All right, for Paul Munichal with the Mirror Price Financial, myself, Ron Jankowski with Channel 4 and PLS Sites, we wish you good investment day. <laughs>